coming up this week. It is the Tokai Love Rock ULS 129, the Japanese one. It's another one of those guitars that you just, every time you walk past it, you have a quick pervert. In the States, I think they're very hard to come by, probably due to pressure from the big G. Let me clarify, because I wanted to fact check that. Yeah, there is, there is a certain amount of truth in my thumbnail. Although it does occur to me, this is a post-truth world, so it didn't really matter if it's true anyway, does it? Apparently. I'm going down a bloody Les Paul rabbit hole again. Hello, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Guitaristas. So if you saw last week's Guitar Safari to Denmark Street, you'll know what this one's all about, won't you? It is the Tokai Love Rock ULS 129. The Japanese one that I couldn't resist. <laughs> I bagged it. <laughs> I brought it home with me. Now, let's just take a minute to, to look at this guitar. It's bloody gorgeous. <laughs> well, I think so. I've been doing little else but look at it for the last week. I've been playing it a lot, obviously. But when I haven't been playing it, I've been looking at it. It's another, it's another one of those guitars that you just, every time you walk past it, you have a quick perv at it. Can't help it. I love these plain tops. I'm not a big flame, flamey Les Paul sort of person. I like a bit of flame from time to time, you know, but not too much. This is, this is my ideal, I think. Called the Violin Burst, this one. It's quite a dark sort of, it's kind of an in-between a cherry and a tobacco, really, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's look at it some more. Bloody gorgeous. Anyway, so that's my initial review. We'll go a little bit deeper now, though. We'll take it apart, have a closer look, find out what it's made of, do all the weights and measures, you know, all the pickup readings, look under the pickups, inside the control cavity. Yeah, see how it's made and stuff. So, And then we'll come back and we'll play it, see what it sounds like, of course, go through the controls and stuff. So, yeah, that's all going to happen. Uh, it'll be a long film, this probably, about 45 minutes. If you haven't got that much time on your hands, don't worry, the timestamps are in the description box. You can just skip forward to hear what it sounds like or whatever. If, however, you've got a little bit of time on your hands, go and get a cup of tea and some nibbles, you know, the score. Come back, chill out, and, and let's get stuck in and find out a little bit more about the Japanese Tokai. Yeah, let's get stuck in. So Tokai, very briefly, because there's, there's a lot more to it than this, but um, basically Tokai, one, one of the original what they called the lawsuit guitar manufacturers. In the 70s, the big brands, Gibson and Fender, them two, were knocking out some pretty questionable product. They'd both been taken over by big corporations and had forgotten how to make guitars, apparently. So along came the Japanese and reverse engineered some of the originals and they showed the big brands how to make guitars again. And, and in particular, Gibson, they showed them how to have they made Les Pauls that people wanted to buy, not the sort of stuff that they were being forced to buy in the, in the 70s. You know, the, all the Gibson specs in that time were all over the place. You know, they, they re reissued guitars with completely the wrong specs. So the Japanese showed them how, how it was done. And of course, you know, Gibson and Fender sued, sued them and stuff. And that's where the term lawsuit comes from. But somehow or other, Tokai have been making those guitars ever since and have got a fabulous reputation for making brilliant guitars. They're not 
that easy to come by. Um, as you know, in the States, I think they're very hard to come by, probably due to pressure from the big G. But anyway, here in the UK, if you saw last week's film, I went into Rose Morris, which is, one of, which is the largest UK distributor. They're all still available, um, which is exciting. And this, this was the first time I was able to actually try a Japanese one. I've got a gold top Chinese made one, this one. Uh, which you've seen on the channel, which I really like this guitar, and I upgraded this one with uh, Boutique Paths and all the wiring, and we had a bit of a laugh trying to fit the switch in and stuff. Uh, I'll put a link to that series, a series on this in the in the description box. You should watch that. But that's the, the budget version, the Chinese one. Now, I'm going to put the ranges, the current ranges on the, on the screen, okay? Not that, I can't remember what I paid for that one. I think I got that one cheaper, but... But currently, and I'm going to have to re refer to my notes, um, UALS62 is the cheaper version, the Chinese version, which is retailing at around about 599 And then there's this Japanese-made one, ULS129. Retail price of this is 1599 English pounds, incidentally. And then there's a up model, slightly higher, slightly higher spec model, What's that? ULS150, retailing at around about 2299 Now, the difference between that one, the expensive, the most expensive one, and this one is the finish. This one here is a poly finish. That one there, that one, whatever it is, is nitro. So they're making a version with the highest possible spec so i've got a chinese one i've got this one and of course now what i'm going to try and do is get my hands on the nitro one so that i can do the proper comparison what are the difference between these models rather than try and get into it today which is going to confuse me let alone you so today i'm just going to specifically talk about this model if you've got any questions you can ask them in the comments and i'll i'll try and answer them but specifically this model, which I think represents a really good budget alternative to the Gibson Les Paul. And look, I mean, I had a, a Gibson Les Paul standard in Heritage Cherry until not long ago. I've, I've actually sold that now, as you probably know, if you watch the channel. But I, I, it's fresh in my memory. And I, you know, I... <laughs> I think this one's better. Why? I can't answer that straight away. I'll try and answer that later. It's it's probably a combination of how I feel about Gibson as a corporation as much as many other things. But I do know that this guitar, I've found it very difficult to put down. I really, really like playing this guitar. Whereas I didn't necessarily play the Gibson very much. I mean, unfortunately, you know, making a film like this, it's, it's impossible to avoid those uh, comparisons with the Gibson, isn't it? I mean, it's a Gibson Les Paul knockoff. So you're going to, you know, people buy these because they're a, they're a more affordable alternative. In this case, more affordable alternative to the Gibson and questionably they're better. Um, this one here, it's got a... An African mahogany body. This is a two-piece body. African mahogany. It's got Canadian maple cap. Two-piece cap. You can barely see the join in that. Um, mahogany neck. One-piece neck. All one-piece neck. Um, they call this neck asymmetrical U-shape. That description put me off and... There's one of the reasons I really wanted to try one of these before I bought one. Often I've bought things unseen, but I thought, well, if it's a U-shape, I might not like that. I'll be honest with you, it feels nothing like a U-shape. It feels like a medium C-shape. It feels like uh, something between a 50s and 60s, not too thin, not too fat. Yeah, I'll put the uh, profile and measurements up on the screen so you can see for yourselves. Okay, here's the neck measurements and profile at the first fret. 
And here's the neck measurements and profile up at the 12th fret. So there you go. Um, asymmetrical, well, I don't know. I can't feel asymmetrical. Can we see it in those pictures? <laughs> I haven't filmed that bit yet, so I don't know. I'll be interested to look at that and see, because as I say, I can't feel anything unusual about it. It feels comfortable, not too fat, not too thin. No problems with playing it at all. And I did, I played an Epiphone once with an asymmetrical neck and it felt weird. This one, no, not at all. So um, yeah, it feels normal. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having a look at those pics myself. But anyway, moving on, it's got an Indian rosewood fingerboard on this. There you go. Nice looking fingerboard. Indian rosewood. It's got medium jumbo, jumbo, Sanko 213, I think it was, frets. Uh, we'll have a closer look at those in a minute once we get the strings off. It's got a cow bone nut. And uh, as you can see, vintage spec, Cluson style tuners. These are made by Tyco. It says in the spec, T-A-I-K-O. Look at my notes then. There you go. Nice colour buttons. Uh, one piece mahogany neck. I said that, didn't I? Made in Japan, stamped there. Stamped in serial number there. I'm going to take the strings off and we'll, we'll go close. And then we'll have a close look at the fit and finish, okay? Let's get the strings off. Oh no, before we do that, let's weigh it. Right, here we go. There you go. It's under nine pounds, eight pound, 15 ounces. So only just, which of course is just over four kilos. So, but again, um, it, it's a pretty good weight for a Les Paul. Um, I, my favourite weight, as you might know, is less than that, but it doesn't feel heavy at all, this. I, I was saying this was, a, I guess this was around about eight and a half pounds. I was probably being a little bit optimistic, but, you know, when you come in at like eight, seven, eight, eight, they're really good weight, Les Pauls. Under nine pound is really good. Now, let's have a look. <laughs> now, let me say, I'm just get rid of this. There's a great guitar store in the UK called Code of Music. And they weigh all their guitars and put pictures on their website, you know, like like Sweetwater do, so you can actually choose the top and weight of your choice. So I had a look at some of their Les Pauls. In fact, I look at all of their Les Pauls to see if we could find one that compared to this weight wise. Um, I'll put the pictures up on the screen. This is what I came up against. There's a fifties cherry here, ten pound two ounces. Another one, oh nine pound six ounces. A 60s iced tea, left-handed, £9.8 ounces. Uh, a 50s cherry, £9.6 ounces. A deluxe gold top, £10.7 ounces. Ooh. A 50s cherry, £10.2 ounces. And there's a bourbon burst, £9.9 9 ounces. So this under £9, so they're all heavier. A fair bit heavier, really. So that tends to be the thing with the Gibsons. You know, if you're thinking of getting a Les Paul, think about the weight. Because if you end up with one at, at £10 or more, if you end up with this bloody gold job at £10.7, you're going to regret it. Unless you're mad. So think on that. From what I understand here, the Tokai's are consistently the right way because back when they made them you know in the early days when they were using old growth timber and stuff African mahogany I mean this is African mahogany when they were using them back in the day they were all kind of that weight weren't they if you look at the bursts back in the day they were kind of between you know eight six eight seven to, to nine pounds nine ish pounds so, cool. Nice weight. <laughs> mm.
Okay, so now we we can have a closer look at the the fingerboard and frets and fit and finish. So I'm going to do some close-ups here. Let's start here with the binding. You can't see. There's no ridge or join whatsoever. And also, with my naked eye, I can't see, I can't really see any tooling marks whatsoever. It's really clean. And the frets are, of course, really well finished. Here you go. Yeah, some close up so you can see what I'm talking about. And even and then going going into the the cutaway, obviously you can see the see the maple cap there, a little bit of the maple cap showing through as it should. And on the binding there's God, I'm not, I don't think I've ever seen it. Anything so clean? Just just looking at these bits here. You normally see a little bit of gnarly paint or something. I can't really. Yeah. Same as it goes round, all the binding there. It's bloody gorgeous. I think it's true what they say. You know, the Japanese are very good at this sort of thing. They really care about the product that they're putting out. It shows, you know, it really does show. Okay, so enough of me gushing about that. It's nice to see it. Look, it's nice to see it. It's nice to see, to have a guitar where you you don't have to make compromises, which you always do with the Gibson. There's always something on a Gibson. If it's not the paintwork, it's... There's something. There's always something. Now, this is a poly finish, as I've said, but... I mean, I was sort of saying it doesn't really feel like it. It doesn't really feel like it or look like it. It looks like a nitro finish. It really, I mean, it does. It looks like a nitro finish. It's, you know, it's, it's got some, or well, the marks will wipe off. You know, it's got handling marks on it now, but no, it's got no ghosting or anything from, you know, I'm just going to take that off because it's a fall off, but I don't. It's got no stand rash. Not that this has been on my stand, but it wouldn't have. It's a tough finish. It feels nice. I suppose that's the only thing that I wondered about. I thought, oh, I've been, you know, to get the full benefit of like for likeness with a Gibson, you'd need to, you'd need to try one with a poly finish. Which is really why I think I'm probably going to have to. I'll have to get a poly, a, a nitro finish one. Did I say poly? I, I'll have to get a nitro finish one to do a proper comparison. And I might even end up having to. Well, I will have to. I'm going to. I'm going down a bloody Les Paul rabbit hole again. I can see myself getting another Gibson Les Paul as well to do all these comparisons with in the future. I suppose I've got to have one in my arsenal, really, haven't I? I can't really speak with any authority on the matter. Right, well, for now, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, look, let's talk about the hardware. Right, so first off, this particular model just comes with some fairly, what I say is fairly basic hardware. And here it is in this bag. Um, and it's just a, a standard weight stop towel piece, you know. And... ABR1 style bridge. One of the things that sets this apart from the higher up model is the higher up model comes with a lightweight aluminium tailpiece and a, 
and a brass saddle bridge. Um, now I happen to have some in my box of tricks, a lightweight Faber one and a bridge with brass saddles. So when I changed the strings when I got this home, I fitted them straight away. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> so this has got a slightly upgraded hardware on this model and obviously I'll put the links to this stuff in the description box. This is going to cost you around about 100 quid this extra but I thought it's going to it takes it so much closer to the the higher end model because the pickups are the same um the wiring's the same although the other ones the other one, I did say I wasn't going to get into this but apart from that the other one's got orange drop capacitors and nitro apart from that it's the same yeah so I put these on that's going to stay there for a minute. Um, Switchcraft toggle. Switchcraft jack. CTS parts. We're going to have a look inside that in a second. And we're going to take the pickups out and see what they are. Oh, yeah. What I wanted to show you is this is a fundamental difference between this and the Gibson. And it, I've showed you this before on the Eastmans. It's how they connect the bridge to the body. The vintage Gibsons and all custom shop Gibsons have these thumb wheels and the post screw directly into the maple cap, believe it or not. There you go. You can see that. Whereas Gibson Les Paul standards and all import guitars and all cheaper guitars the posts screw into metal bushings that, you know, push in to the maple cap. The fundamental difference, this is how they used to make them. And how all the custom shops are made. That's a big selling point for me because I think it's, it's right. It's how they used to do it. And I think that it must help. <laughs> it just must help the, 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 the vibration transfer. It must make a difference. I mean, obviously, all these things are, you know, minor differences. But, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a good thing in my book. Right. Right. What I'm going to do now, take some pickup readings. Right. Let's put all controls on 10. Let's start with the, fuck me. <laughs> I didn't expect that. The uh, the bridge pickup is reading fourteen point three eight k, and the uh, the inductance of that is seven point six nine. Okay, neck nine point two three k. I mean. 5.50 Henry's is the inductance. Well, just do a middle reading before I speak. The middle reading, 5.62. Just go back to that, <laughs> that bridge again. 14.38. Well, I'm, see, I'm, I'm baffled because these were described as being fairly low output PAF-like pickups. And that confuses me because that's not what that suggests to me. So, well, we'll have to, um, we'll see what it sounds like. What we'll do is we'll take them out and have a look underneath and see what they, see what they say. Now, one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the pick guard off because I, um, I'm wondering if I should remove it completely. Why I hear you ask. Well, firstly, we'll say, look, you know, you can, I think there's, I'm still debating whether or not they look better without a, a pit guard, scratch plate, pit guard, I, I never know what the right term is. Of course, this leaves a hole there, which can easily get over. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it looks better or not. What do you think? What I do know is, however... I find it easy to play without it on because I, I lock myself on here a lot. 
Um, you know, same with Telecasters. I lock onto the bridge a lot, and I'm used to playing like that. And if you look at the Eastman that I've got, it hasn't got a pit guard. So I think that's why I've begun to like that look. But also, you can see the, the sort of scratch marks there, which <laughs> obviously that is intended to prevent. But, I mean, I don't mind having marks on my guitars. It's kind of like a badge of honour for me. It shows me that I played them. So I might do, I don't know, I might leave that off for now, for when I do the playing. And then we can decide, let me know, should this have a pit guard or shouldn't? Shouldn't it have a pit guard? Let me know in the comments. Right, onwards. Let's have a look and see what's under here. Let's find out if Tokai leave enough cable to... Yes! Well, there you go. Okay, so I could probably undo the other one as well. Yeah, you can see inside, it looks nice and clean. Nice and clean. Um, the neck tenon seems to just come to there. I'm no expert, but that's what that looks like to me. Um, apart from that, there's an out to see thick maple cap. You can see that there. And the pickups are identified as Tokai Mark II S, N for neck, and B for bridge. Okay. That's that. We'll pop those back and we'll look inside the control cavity. Shielding on both of those. I think I might have said CTS pots, but I lied. Korean ginseng. That's what that says. I think that actually is a switchcraft switch. Uh huh, yeah. I thought as much. So this has got the, um, the Gibson style bell end. Truss rod adjuster, the big old nut, rather than the Allen wrench style. So let's put it back together now, put some strings on, plug it in, see what it sounds like. See you in a minute. Here we are. This is what it sounds like unplugged. I can't even play a bloody G chord. <laughs> there you go, I'm not going to do it again. Right, so that, yeah, unplugged, plugged in. I'm not using any pedals at the moment for this first bit. If I use any pedals, I'll show you. So it's all clean, straight into the Princeton 65. And I've rolled off the pickups to start with. But no doubt, <laughs> they'll get turned up to 10 pretty quickly. That's normally what happens. But this is what it sounds like. So let's start on the, the, the bridge, the bridge pickup. 14.8, was it? Yeah, that's it's rolled off, so... It's quite compressed, so it's, it's you know it's pushing quite hard, isn't it?
Sounds nice, doesn't it? I mean, it, sound, it sort of sounds quite dark, but I mean, I've come to realise that that's what a Les Paul's meant to do, really, isn't it? And if we want to put a, put an edge of edge of brightness on it, we've got things like this treble bill, spark booster. <laughs> See? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gradually working it out, I think. or well, I hope. But it's nice. Uh, I'm, just, I'm obviously keeping it quite clean. <laughs> Probably most of today. Trying to do a bluesy thing, really. You know, a kind of a, a Bloomfieldy thing type thing. A Bloomfieldy thing type thing. That wasn't him, by the way. That was, I think. You thought I'd forgotten it, didn't you? So that's the the bridge, 14.8k. This is the neck. The neck is set quite low on this, but it was set like this when I got it, so I've kind of left it. Yeah, it's it sort of sitting under the pickup ring. These are these are not low output, are they? There. So I mean that's down on four now. Which is great if you wanna, you know, clean. And then Controls work, you can hear that. Tone. sound.
Reminds me a little bit of something that Hawk Lords did. <laughs> Sounded all right, didn't it? I always wish, I always wish, always wish I had more time to, to, to play it better, really. I'm always a bit limited. And then, you know, I'm hard on myself. Um, and I think for good reason, because I think obviously given time, I could always do something better. I could always have a, come up with a better idea and just, and just be better. I, and, I, I'm, I, and I'm mentioning it now because I think a guitar like this it deserves better sometimes. I'm not rubbish, but, you know, what, what, what we get every week is what I've managed to come up with in really only a couple of hours actual filming the playing. I spend a couple of hours each week filming the playing. I know, you know, you'd think oh, I'd have a lot more time, but the actual filming of these episodes is a small fraction of the time it takes to actually make them. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how long it even just takes to import the, the footage from the cameras into the computer and then the huge amount of time it takes to render that footage into the editing software, let alone the amount of time that it takes to edit. So sadly, Probably, probably the most important part. Yeah, probably. Well, one of the most important parts is the playing. It, it it gets a fraction of the amount of attention that it should. So, um, that's why it's a bit shit sometimes. I don't think it was shit this week. I think it was just all right. But hopefully, I've showed <laughs> that the guitar sounds pretty good. As always, the guitar's better than me. But it sounded good. I thought it sounded good. Nice wide range of tones. <laughs> yeah, I sound like I know what I'm talking about. But, you know, I, I'm not an expert. I'm learning this stuff. You know, I've had several Les Pauls now. This is another one. And I think it sounds good. And uh, the more guitars I review, the more I kind of get my head around what I should be doing to, to demonstrate them. So one day, you know, one day, well, one day, <laughs> it'll all be spot on. It's going to take a while, though. So, yeah, it sounded bloody good. I like it. I like it. And I love the look of it. I love the look of this guitar. 
it's, as I said earlier, I get, well, I, I, what I said earlier is actually was I've been perving over this the same way that I did when I got the Gibson Les Paul standard, because that was a stunning looking guitar. There's a shot of it. That was a stunning looking guitar in, guitar in Cherry Burst, and, you know, and there was nothing wrong with that guitar at all. But <laughs> the fact that it was, well, it, it, was, it, was an, it was an expensive guitar. That one cost me £2,200. This one, being the, you know, the, I don't know, the mid-range Tokai, with just the poly finish. I, d I got a good deal on this guitar, but I traded a guitar and cash, and it owes me this, just 1,450 pounds. That's what this owes me. So it's considerably less than the Gibson. And I think that's a big, you know, that's that really psychologically, We've, we've said this so many times before, it, it helps because it, if it doesn't owe you too much, you don't, you don't feel the guilt of owning something. You don't feel it has to be brilliant. It doesn't have to live up to such expectations of being, bloody hell, that cost you know, more than a car. <laughs> well, depending on what sort of cars you buy. You know what I mean? This, this owes me £1,450, so... It's kind of like, it's not even in this day, and it's not an expensive guitar. I mean, Epiphone's cost £1,450 now. You know, this is way better than any Epiphone you could buy. Not that I'm knocking Epiphones, but well, I'm not that I'm knocking the affordable Epiphones. I am knocking the expensive Epiphones because I don't think they're worth what Epiphone are charging for them. <laughs> How did we get there? Um... But this is this is just a better guitar. It you know the materials that it's made out of. You know, it's African mahogany. It's Indian rosewood. It's Canadian maple. It's it's a Japanese tokai, and the Japanese have always been every bit as good, if not better, at building guitars than Americans. It's fact. So I'm I'm. I get a really good feeling owning this guitar. And it don't own me too much, so I'll probably be able to keep it. Every time I, I've got an expensive guitar, I think, well, you know, I kind of have to sell that really because I have to fund more affordable guitars because the channel doesn't, still doesn't pay for itself. We'll get into that another time. In fact, we won't. We'll get into it now because it's about... the. What I wanted to talk to you about also today is the clickbait title that I've I've put in today. You know, banned in the USA, I think it is, isn't it? Um, and you know, and I don't really want to do stuff like that, but it's kind of necessary because it's all about clicks. We get paid per click, and the the sad fact of the matter is, if I put Tokai ULS129 in the thumbnail, I'll get half the clicks that I will no doubt get with the thumbnail I've put, suggesting something a little bit sexier, you know? Ooh, what's this? Intrigue. I try not to go too far in that direction. In fact, I've battled with it and I've said, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do what I do. And if people click, they click. If they don't, they don't. But it's it's proved to be the wrong the wrong thing to do because YouTube is all about clicks. If people don't click, uh, if you subscribers, you guys that are still watching, I've said this before, if you don't click straight away, or if, if fewer of you click straight away, in the first half an hour, probably, YouTube thinks it's not very good. It doesn't show the, it doesn't show the thumbnail to people. And if it doesn't show that, that thumbnail to people, they can't click on it, the channel can't grow, and I earn less money to spend on guitars. So at the moment, I'm still trying to get to the point where I've grown enough to not have to worry about all that sort of shit. But at the moment, it's, it's what it is. So that's why you got the clickbait title today. Now, let me clarify, because I wanted to fact check that. 
this rather than just say, oh, it's been banned in the USA. I can clarify that to, the, to, to an extent anyway. And basically the story is that Toco used to sell Les Pauls in, 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 in the States in, in the 80s. 1987, I think it was, Gibson filed their patent claims on the, on the Les Paul, various you know, copyright patents, whatever they call them. And at that point, Tokai had to withdraw because obviously Gibson uh, issued the cease and desist. I, 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 you know, I assume, I mean, I don't know if that's an actual fact then, but I do know that around about 2000, in the early 2000s, the new Tokai distributor wanted to, you know, uh, sell them in the States again. So their attorneys worked with Gibson's attorneys to come up with a, a few tweaks that Gibson were happy with so that Tokai could sell them in the state. And they thought that they'd overcome the problems. And then, lo and behold, Gibson did issue cease and desist notes to Tokai in 2004 to try and prevent them, you know, infringing their copyrights in the States. So Tokai just decided not to bother and withdrew them. And they, don't, and they haven't been sold in the States ever since. So, yeah, there is, there is a certain amount of truth in my thumb now. Although it does occur to me, this is a post-truth world, so it doesn't really matter if it's true anyway, does it? Apparently. So, moving on, let's talk a bit more about the guitar, shall we? Now, I've got all that off my chest. What don't I like about it? Well, I was, well, I suppose I was a little bit disappointed to discover that the pots weren't CTS. Not that there was anything wrong with them. They, they worked, didn't they? They sounded, they worked. So that's kind of a probably, probably irrelevant. I didn't talk about the weird looking caps. These weird looking, like, Sputniks is what came to mind. Or they look like diodes, don't they? It's something a bit weird. Don't know what that, don't know what they're all about. But again, I guess the tone controls worked. I probably will be inclined to, to change these out there and stick some orange drop caps in and probably, probably um, some CTS pot. I might actually get a proper wiring loom for this. I'll tell you what I'm just going to do quickly though. I'm just going to see if these pots are the same size as CTS because I wouldn't want to ream this one out like I did, had to on the Chinese one. Let me just get my cloth, see if I can get one of these off and we'll have a quick look. Right, we'll go, <laughs> we'll go the spoon method. Oh, I need two spoons. Oh, no, I don't. That's what I did when it turned it around. It does work, look, just a bit at a time. I didn't mention, by the way, this has got thumb bleeders. Seven and a half mil, basically. Here we go. There you go. Nine mil on the CTS. Okay, I'm glad I did that because my suggestion was because the only basic, di well, the differences between this 1500 quid version and the t over two grand version of this guitar is that the expensive one has the nitro finish, same as a Gibson Les Paul standard. but the pickups are the same. The more expensive one has hardware like this, which as you know from earlier, I've changed this. I've put aluminium bridge and a brass saddle bridge on. The more expensive one has that. Beyond that, it's the pots and the caps. CTS pots, orange drop caps in the more expensive one, whereas these are Jinsung Korean pots. With um, smaller shafts, so if you want to put CTS pots in this, you'll have to ream the guitar out, which I wouldn't want to do to this guitar. So these pots are going to be staying. I could change the caps, put orange drop caps in. 
if I wanted, I might, I might not. Anyway, well, okay, I'm glad I, I did that. Now I'm going to have to try and get this bloody nut back on. That little diversion over. I'm glad I checked that, though. This is a problem we found with the Chinese Tokai. If you saw that film, all sorts of snags because what you think is going to fit doesn't. I had a real problem with the switch on that. This is a switchcraft anyway, so you wouldn't need to change this. Oh, I found a fault in this guitar. Um, the jack plate is wonky. Look at that. Yeah, there you go. But that's pretty much the only fault that I found with, <laughs> if you could call it a fault, with QC on this. It's, um, as I said earlier, it's kind of immaculate. And it looks great, doesn't it? And as you can see, I've left the pick plate, scratch plate, pick guard off. I think it looks better, don't you? What do you reckon? Definitely feels better playing because I can do all that. And I seemed to be playing it quite okay. You know what I mean? Didn't have any, you know, neck felt great. Guitar felt great. I mean, Les Paul's a difficult, quite a difficult play anyway. Obviously, when you want to get up the dusty end, they are not the most comfortable guitars because they sit, they sit in a weird place compared to SGs. That's why people have an issue with SGs when they go from Les Pauls to SGs because they get used to Les Pauls. This cutaway here on the Les Paul, if you put it on your right leg, you're kind of right hunched up over it. A lot of people play it with it sitting on their left leg which is great, but I tried that and it was out of shot of all the cameras, so I had to go back to me right leg. But anyway, um, yeah, I, so yeah, it's, um, I will have to try the, I will have to try the Nitro one, the, 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 the full fat version, I think. Yeah. This sounds great, plays great. Feels great. And there's a few compromises to keep the cost down, I suppose. If indeed they're compromises, you know, things like parts, it isn't going to change the sound, if at all. Really, is it? You know. It'd be nice to experiment. But I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go reaming this guitar out to change the parts. You might be able to get CTS pots with an arrow shaft. I don't know. You probably can, can't you? I'll look into that. Uh, anyway, what else? I think I've kind of covered it, really. I think I've covered it. I think, as I said earlier, I think I'm going down a, a Les Paul rabbit hole again. I think it's been probably six months. I think it's about six months since I sold my Gibson. I'm thinking I should get another... i tell you what I'm thinking. I'll tell you exactly what I'm thinking. I th think I am going to go on a search for another Les Paul Standard Gibson that's under nine pounds. See if I can find another one. The one I sold was it was eight pound, eight pound eleven ounces. So I probably had the one, but I saw that went to a great home. So um, you know, I don't regret that because I used that money to buy some other guitars. It's kept us going for you know six months. Um, not that alone, but you know that's bought a lot of these other guitars that I'm probably have to sell to buy another Les Paul. It's the circle of guitars, you know, you've got to keep it turning. I wouldn't have played that had I kept it. So, you know, I'll probably lose a few hundred quid on it, but I've been able to use that money. Or, you know, I lose by the time I buy another one, I mean. Fortunately, they're still on, as you can see from those picks I dropped in, that you can still pick up a Gibson for 2,200 English pounds. Not sure what it's like in the States at the moment, but retail price here is 2,800 English pounds. But no one's paying that for them. No one wants to pay that for them. So they're all selling for 2,200 still at the moment. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a hunt and we'll try and turn that into a series of films. And I'm also going to try and get my hands on a Nitro Tokai. I might have to borrow some of these things in the future. I haven't done that today. I've, I've bought everything, but... You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to, I can't justify spending four and a half grand on guitars just to make a couple of films out of them 
and earn $500 back. It doesn't make sense. So we'll see. We might have to switch things up a little bit. What we are definitely going to be having to do is clickbait the titles a little bit more in the future. I've experimented trying not to do that. It doesn't work. So there's going to be some clickbait, but it's not going to be stupid shit that some people do. You know, I'm not going to be promising anything that I'm not going to deliver on, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I'll be, you know, I'll be, I'll be, but I have to play the game. So apologies in advance if that annoys you. It annoys me. It annoys me more than it annoys you, trust me. But it's got to be done, hasn't it? Unless several hundred more people sign up to my TV channel, because that is really how I bump up my income. There's the address, sign up. It's $5 a month and it supports this channel. And eventually it will take over from YouTube. I won't be here forever, but that's, that's the future. So, and that's where all the extra content is. I'm not going to do any extra content this week either. If you want extra content, go to the TV channel. Sign up for 30 days free. See what's going on. Look at all the extra content I've already done on there. There's loads of it. You've missed loads. So, yeah, check that out. And look, it's all going to... You know, I'm sorry, I'm whinging a little bit today. I didn't intend to do this, but I've done it now, so it's too late. There's no going back. Come back next week, and I promise I won't whinge at all, okay? And uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to do next week. So come back and find out. Same time, same place. Here, come and join us. I look forward to it. See you then. Ta-da. Mm -hmm.